gentlemen, esteemed guests, and fellow enthusiasts of ancient music. What a captivating start to our journey into the history of music in ancient Elam and Middle East. The mesmerizing rhythms skillfully performed by Said Qiyasi on the DAF have set the stage for an enchanting exploration of ancient melodies that have transcended time and space. We find ourselves gathered at the historic Corpus Christi College in Cambridge, where the captivating rhythms have ushered us into the world of wonder. This exceptional event, organized by Persian Wonders in collaboration with Cambridge University Persian Society, promises to be an unforgettable voyage into the past. Our distinguished speaker, Dr. Richard Dumbrell, is poised to offer us remarkable insights into the musical heritage of the ancient lands. Richard, a distinguished British archaeomusicologist, is renowned for his expertise in interpreting cuneiform texts of music theory written in Sumerian, Babylonian, and Hurrian. His passion for the subject has led to remarkable achievements, including the translation of the oldest known song found in northwest Syria at the site of Ugarit. Today, Richard will grace our stage to enlighten us about the history of music in ancient Elam, sharing his profound knowledge with a presentation that promises to captivate our minds. Later, we will also have the privilege of witnessing Dr. Savan's performance of the earliest form of musical notation, an opportunity to experience the melodies that resonated in ancient times. <clears throat> Following Richard's talk, we will have a brief Q&A session, 10 minutes break, and then we will be treated to a live performance by the talented vocalist and top player, Babak Mizai and Said Riyasi. Their musical prowess will surely transport us back in time to the enchanting sound of the past. As the day unfolds, let us only absorb the wealth of the knowledge that will be shared, but also take the opportunity to network and engage with enthusiasts during the refreshments. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's warmly welcome Richard Dumbrell. Your presence here is a testament to your dedication to the world of archaeomusicology, and we are truly privileged to have you shared your insights with us today. Hello, working? Superb. Well, you know, something is absolutely wonderful to see you today here because it might not have happened. I passed the last week and a half in the Middle East. It was not a nice place to be. I had a great fall in, in Baghdad. It was not because of Hulagu, but because of the uh, Minister of Culture, bad paving of the hotel where we stayed. Then, because it was 40 Celsius in Baghdad and the air, con air conditioning was blasting through, I caught a terrible laryngitis, pharyngitis, and I have sneezed continuously since my return in London. And my voice is not what it ought to be, and I'm frightfully sorry about it. And I'm exhausted, furthermore, with all this. Anyway, the show must go on. And firstly, as a programming on to uh, uh, this talk, I feel compelled to, to give advance notice that I shall not crack any code. It's dangerous. I shall not debunk any theory. And I shall not mention any of our aliens and sisters uh, uh, in uh, 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 their contribution to music. I leave this for highly professional skilled people such as, can't remember his name. And uh, uh, however, I deeply regret that I cannot reassure you that animals were not injured in the course of the preparation for this lecture. As our ancestors in the Middle East, used animals' guts for strings, 
they use their skins for uh, soundboards, they use their bones for making glue, and many other things, God knows what for. So animals really contributed to, <laughs> destructed remarkably, to contribute to the uh, instrumentarium of our uh, ancient civilizations. And uh, for this I, dis I decline absolutely all responsibility. Not my doing. Secondly, artificial intelligence. Ah, marvelous. Everybody, you know, oh, have you got the new AI? AI here, AI there. Well, you know, it's, it's, it seems to be very fashionable. But as all fashionable as I am due to the passing of years, I think I still prefer the usage of natural intelligence. And on this occasion, I brought up Sevan Habib, remarkable soprano, who will surpass uh, artificial intelligence by far. And I'm very grateful for her presence. She is a remarkable singer, just finished a doctorate at King's. Uh, she is from, she is Armenian originally, spent some time in Syria, Lebanon, and then London. And I discovered this gem, and we worked together for many years in different shores, in, from Beirut to, to God knows where. And uh, it's always with great pleasure that uh, Sevan contributes to my, uh, is my musical companion, and uh, has for some years uh, be submitted to my, uh, to my arduous exotic incantations. Thirdly, during this talk, I will use the alphabetic and Latin music notation. It doesn't mean that I want to, uh, to uh, uh, occidentalize the music of the Middle East or, or Latinize it. It's because, uh, frankly, we don't have any names for the, the notes they had. And also, um, if, you, if we really look at it uh, uh, in detail, the, the notes that they used three, four thousand years ago were not that different from our notes. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's, it seems to me all right to use the alphabetic or the Latin names for those. I wish we, we had uh, their names. But would it make any difference? I don't really think so. So the first part of this talk will uh, discuss the rare extant instruments in the iconography and in the iconography. The second part will explain the theory, which is common to Ena, Elam, Sumer, Akkad, uh, etc. Uh, it is highly probable that the music theory was shared in the whole part of the Middle East, from Elam to Akkad to Sumer, up to the shores of north northwest Mediterranean, to, to the southern, to Palestine, uh, to ancient Egypt. We have evidence of fret markings of instruments which have survived, which tend to confirm that they all had in common certain, if not all, certain intervals which makes us believe that they might have a common system of tonification, of tonal system. But what is most important in the music of the ancient Near East is that it encapsulates the whole of the melodic world of music, history, from the first seminal pitches to complex forms which have survived to this day. In the ancient Middle East we find systems which are still practiced in certain, uh, in various African cultures. We find systems still used in the Far Orient. We find the basis for Greek theory, the basis for Plato's muses. We find quantification methods ratios of string lengths which are inversely proportional to ratios of frequency. This is noted as early as 2300 BC. We have the tablets as evidence for it. 
We found the sources for Heptatonism, for the eight ecclesiastical modes, which are still practiced in the Christian churches of Europe and elsewhere. Uh, uh, we find Bichus' new Platonician theories. We find the basis for chromaticism as early as 4,000 years ago. And even the possibility of a sexagesimal equal temperament system over two millennia before the West even thought about it. These theories are not myths, they are tangible realities. Their sources stem from the transposition of oral pre-literate music into theory as soon as cogent writing systems allowed for their commitment to clay tablets. Unlike ancient Greek theory, which we know from late copies, from unknown sources, and uh, of copies of translations, and so forth, the music of the ancient Middle East holds the evidence of the evolution of its systems dating from their inception, the oldest uh, from the early third millennium BC, where we find names of uh, musical strings and musical instruments, and this is undisputed. However, there are only a few tablets of theory which have survived, Sadly, only eight is not much, and they are fragmentary, fragmentary. But they are built in such a way that it was possible to extrapolate, seriously, not cheating, what would have been the beginning and the end, or what have you. So we know what it would be. And of course, it, 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 the theory within checks is, you can check it up by playing it and seeing how things work. Uh, yes, okay, but what about ancient Egypt? Well, ancient Egypt, from, from ancient Egypt, sadly, we have no textual evidence of music theory. Nothing. On the other hand, there are many, many excellent musical instruments which are invaluable because, yet again, the frets could be measured from the next and from the fret marks you can determine pitches used and this is especially with the 18th dynasty which gave a very very accurate uh, uh, and general practice of certain uh, certain intonations it's uh, absolutely remarkable and it is also remarkable that these pitch uh, distances we find them also in Alajahuyuk in Hittite land, I've myself made calculations from certain author stats and found it was exactly the same thing. And we find the same uh, 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 marks in other places, which tends to uh, mean that there was a, a musical system which was shared throughout the Mediterra no, Mediterranean uh, Sea. It might have varied it would have had accents, uh, it would have had uh, different intonations, but the tonal basis would have been more or less the same thing. So, the archaeology of the ancient Middle East has provided a minimalist collection of instruments. That's so sad. However, the royal tombs of Ur have produced the oldest string instrument ever excavated, the silver lie from around 2600 BC. Here it is, the copy. And I would say something very uh, pompously, is that I hereby declare that this copy is much more conform to the reality than the awkward restoration we have at the British Museum. I know this for a fact because I will tell you the story. This is most interesting. When Willie unearthed this superb instrument in the tombs of Ur in the uh, winter of 28 or 29, I can't remember, he was very careful in lifting this relic. All the wood inside had gone, so he was clever enough to pour some wax and some sticks of wood to hold the thing, so he lifted it carefully. <coughs> this was really a, a, a remarkable uh, thing he did. And he could transport the lie, this lie, on the flat 
a plank of wood. It arrived at the British Museum in this position. Carefully it was stood up in a window in room 56. But in the summer of 49, 1949, which was very, very hot, what happened? Great disaster. It was so hot that the wax melted and blah, 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 the, the, the instrument collapsed. So, <coughs> of course, the, the organologist, musicologist I am would have said, leave it like this, put the whole lot in a box, don't touch, leave it for experts to have a look in the status in which it is. But no, 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 we were in the 60s, and what do you want to do in the 60s? We want to make sh it shine as if it came directly from Woolworths, you know, all shining and plasticky and all nice. So what they did, they took all the fragments of silver and they noted them carefully, thousands of numbers. They took it ap apart completely. They found traces of wood here and there, which they tried, attempted at uh, identifi identifying, probably some uh, uh, boxwood in some places. And guess what? In the, in the work, they lost the ori original head of the animal. So the head we have at the Model of the British Museum is a copy. Where is the original? <laughs> God knows. So, eventually, they, they couldn't, they, they had all the flakes of silver, but they were like crisps. <coughs> they would come all the time in their shape of crisp. You could flatten them on the, on the table. They had uh, bags of sand, they flattened them for days, took the sand off and bloops, they came back as curving things, you know. So they decided that the greatest idea would be to make a plastic exo uh, endoskeleton and they would glue on this plastic skeleton with epoxy glue all the fragments of silver and the tesserae and everything which means that this instrument is, is gone forever as uh, we might one day find uh, uh, something to that dissolve epoxy for the moment it's not the case uh, uh, and it's very sad so I was as a young teacher in 71 teaching in France at the time uh, I went to the museum and said this is a, a dreadful thing which has happened to this instrument and I will do something about it and I only did it in 2008 which shows the perseverance I had in my mind to make it work. And if you compare this instrument and the original one, and the, yes, the original one, as I shall uh, show you later, you, you will see uh, uh, it, how it differs. The angles are not the same and so forth. Now, if I can manage to make this work, uh, oh yes, we have this. This is absolutely wonderful. This is a superb illustration of a gold figure from uh, Susa, Middle Elamite, 15 to 1200 BC at the Louvre. Superb thing. Now, just to remind uh, ourselves of the geography of the site, we have, sorry, I'm a bit mixed up with my things. We have Brownish here, the country of Elam, and its proximity to the uh, east with the Persians, the Parthians, the Medes, and to the west, Sumer, Babylon, and Assyria, and the Arabs. Uh, then we have another map, yes, another map where there are more details of Shushenri, Susiana, Susa, hmm? uh, Anshan, and so forth. So it's to show that there were obviously great communications between the cultures of the Mesopotamian cultures and the cultures to the, and the Elamite cultures. Now, next slide is this remarkable 
instrument. It is a ceiling. A ceiling, I don't know for those who do not know, a ceiling is a little lump of clay that you roll in your hands. You've got a bag. Thank you, this might be better. You've got a bag. You tie a knot to close the bag. You open the ceiling in two, the, the, the bullet in two, and you seal it with this wax. And then you roll your seal. And this is what we have here. Uh, it doesn't say much that, you know, why this guy who had this, this signature uh, thing had a musician, we don't know why. Anyway, it is clear that he has this harp, which is a very primitive harp, which I would say is monoxyle, that is, it is made of a single material. Uh, uh, it is not bistructural. Harps can be monoxyle and bistructural, where they have different parts, soundboard part and yoke part, and the strings, of course. Uh, it, it's supposed to give us uh, five, four strings, but it's more likely than it should be three strings. And um, we have on top, you can see above the harp, we have another harp, which would have also three strings. Uh, lower to the left we have some kind of pipes, one turn upside down. I don't know if there are pipes, uh, it's very difficult to say because there is no parallel in any other uh, 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 of the, the glyptic. So we, we cannot really say if this was indeed, uh, these were pipes, musical instruments. They could be simply uh, horns to gather animals or a shofar or something like this, but certainly I doubt it would be a shofar at this time. But anyway, this is an interesting uh, uh, instrument. It's the oldest seal uh, impression that we have from Shoamish, and it dates around 3200 BC, and therefore attests of uh, uh, lies, monoxide harp, sorry, uh, uh, at that period with three strings. And the number three is rather important. Now, the next instrument is not from uh, uh, Elam. It's, it is from Eshtuna. It's a molded plaque of a harp from Le Louvre, 1800 BC. It's a magnificent instrument. Now, we, we see that the instrument is bistructural. It's got uh, Sandbox, which is a part well separate from the yoke, which is horizontal. It, it has more strings, seven, eight possibly. And uh, it, it, we have indications that the music, musician was mobile. Why? Well, because he's sitting on a stool which is foldable. And if it is foldable, it might be the case that he carried it with him and went to square, to other square of the city, playing his instrument uh, in order to earn a bit of money here and there. Now, this instrument is quite uh, uh, characteristic of a little, you see there's a little cross at the top level of the uh, sandbox. And we find these crosses consistently in all the lies. The harp is gone. <coughs> oh yes, if you can, you see, we have on this lie, which is Elamite, and dating from the seventh, no, it's all right, you can read it, sorry. We have these X's, which have become, in, in, Acad in uh, Assyrian, they are called Apsamiku. <coughs> this is the name of the shape. That's all I will bother, bore you with. Now, next. Next. Ah, this is most interesting. We have a lovely plaque <coughs> coming from Susa, so it's Elamite. What was the purpose of these plaques? Uh, my contention is that we had them in temples uh, stuck on the walls. One there, one there, two holes. Uh, 
a log of wood, a bit of wood, and you would hang a curtain that would make the separation between uh, different parts of the temple. Now we see that on the top left, the musician, rather inebriated, he's drinking, quite happy, he has uh, an instrument which is totally it's to believe that the lapis side had drank more than the subject. And I made a, a reproduction of this guy, of this instrument, nearby. I believe it would have been something more like this one, which is akin to the uh, African uh, bolong that we find in Northwest Africa. There are many similarities between the two instruments. So this is indeed a remarkable instrument. I, I, it is known, I'm pretty sure, as a balag in uh, Sumerian, or pronounced balagne, as some say, and bolong in Africa. You know, there are relations um, of etymology here to, which, which are interesting. Now, the next uh, slide shows precisely the evolution of this sign. You see this sign to the left? No, it's not what I have. No. Oh, weird. Ah, perhaps. Well, I'm sorry about this. There's, you can't see it. There's an evolution of the sign which from Balag the, the son of Balag, cuneiforms at a certain time uh, from uh, vert verticality started to turn 90 degrees like this and would were read this way. So the sign for Balag did the same, it was turned to the right and it was read this way. And the, the, uh, it was made of two signs called tub. So tub tub Dub, 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 is the sound for the balag. It's called balag. It's a quite logical way of conceiving, creating the name of an instrument. Now, have we moved? Yes, we have indeed. It's strange, I seem to be a bit confused in my stuff there. Hmm. Did I have this before? No, yes. Okay, we are back there. Now, we, we have here three fragmentary ceilings dating about 2700 BC from the National Museum of Iran, Tehran. I'm pretty sure that they come from the south of Iran, southwest, from Susiana. Now, something which is very interesting in the structure of these uh, harps is that they really represent an animal, it's zoomorphic. We have a cow or a, another horned animal uh, which might have been carved of one bit and then the strings were affixed to it. It is, it is really interesting. Unlike this one where the animal is integrated to the uh, instrument itself. In this case, we have a trapezoid with strings which is stuck on an animal which has been carved on, of something, God knows what. There is a hypothesis that it was made, that the animal was, was made from the hide uh, of the dead animal which was allowed to harden and that the uh, trapezoid of the strings would be then glued to this. It, it is a possibility. There's an interesting thing about these instruments that we see here, is that they would have been called uh, parachitum or farchitum, which would indicate they were parachitum from fars. This is a hypothetical uh, etymology. Now we find here no, very sorry. <laughs> okay, now we come back to the silver lie of her. 
and this is the one which was dug by Willie in 28. This is how it looked when it was at the British Museum uh, until it collapsed in 19. Uh, 49 and you see this is a much more for those here who are musician or musicologist we, we, we agree that this is a much more important uh, an item than a brand new restored thing which means absolutely nothing uh, this shows really that uh, the position of the tuning levers it shows also that another arm um, was here rested on this up, upright. Indeed, it was the arm of the golden lie because there were three lies which were crushed together. Mm? A marvelous thing. Now, the next one. Yes, that, that is a you might have noted a resemblance a few years earlier though uh, myself at the uh, British Museum trying to steal the silver <laughs> <laughs> lie you see it's true because nobody is around so I was hoping that uh, it, I wouldn't be discovered and, um, and uh, the technician Jerry of course didn't allow me to take it back home so it's that's the story anyway i worked a lot on it and uh, realized that you know as i said to you it was so sad and the next one is my reconstruction as you see it here uh, actually it is not entirely my reconstruction it was also done with my student my then student miriam marsotto who who uh, I was on her jury, PhD jury at the Sorbonne, and she came to the British Museum for a postdoc, and part of the postdoc was the reconstruction of this lie, and she, she, I gave her the most sordid of all jobs in the making of the lie. It is to make strings, and she hated it. When you have meters of gluish, yeah, yeah, ugly, stinking uh, string in a bucket of water and you have to twist them and they break and puff, you get to the strings in your face and you're, oh, 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 disgusting thing. But she has become an expert in string making. But I can tell you something, the strings which were made for this harp and others I made have survived for many, many years. I've got strings made this manner with animal guts, uh, which are 30, 40 years, years old, and they are still very, very strong. So there's merit in having these, uh, uh, in using those. Okay. Now, these are two other lies which were found in the Royal Tombs of Ur. They're made of silver. Uh, the one to the left is in Museum of Baghdad, uh, and the one to the right is in Philadelphia. The next instrument that we shall see is, is a, a little gem. <coughs> it was discovered not that long ago by, by Dominique Collomb of the British Museum and it is certainly the oldest depiction of a lute and it dates from about 3200 BC uh, there was some, some dispute, some said no it can't be a, a lute because we do not see the body of the lute at the end and I said this is rubbish because you do not need to have a body of a lute to have a lute if you have a, a, a hollow uh, a reed and a string tight Titan between two extremities of bridge, hey, hey you, you have a loot. And it's progressively and organically that a uh, sandbox will grow on it. So, a remarkably uh, nice instrument. Am I doing for time? Now, next one. We have now the Susan lutes, which are quite typical. There are quite a few of them. You see, the characters are naked. Um, they some are bearded. They uh, hold their instruments at an angle. The angle of the lute is extremely important for the dating of the instruments. 
the steeper the angle, the older they are, the lower the angle, the more modern they are. In the Greek or Roman times, they are held like this. And 2000 BC, this is the way they are held. Some also have argued that this, uh, no, sorry, I'm not there. Let's go back to this one. Now, next one will be two more lutes, and these are more interesting here. These are noble Susan lutenists and harpists, date around 1700 BC. And it is, it is typical of Elam to have dignitaries, or noble men, we assume, uh, uh, playing lutes. Whereas in Mesopotamia, in, uh, in, uh, in Akkad, in Babylonia, in Assyria, lutenists were really uh, confined to the street. There were public, uh, uh, um, you know, entertainers, but were not highly considered. While these guys, if you see clearly, they all have a special necklace, all of them. And they have instruments which are uh, rather small, and uh, uh, their attire indicates their, their, their position in society. So there were uh, uh, these instruments and their playing was really highly considered, which was not the same case. So there's a session with the, with the Babylonians at that time. Now, other ones, yes. And something very interesting here. <coughs> we know here three uh, lute players, and these are a different castes. They are no longer dressed uh, as noble men, if it or if it was possible to say so. They are naked. They exhibit uh, uh, their genitalia. Uh, they have bowed legged, they are bowed legged, they are dwarfs, uh, they are bearded, although not of them, all of them, and uh, their, their, their lutes seem to be strung with two strings. Now, my colleague, uh, my colleague and uh, student, Sepide uh, Haksar, who is in, uh, in Holland right now doing a PhD, and who wants to work with me again on all this this collect connection wants to do is doing her, her PhD uh, on those characters she has discovered recently in a dig in Iran over 200 of them and she thinks that it might be the the, 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 the deformation might be the consequence of an illness of a genetic problem they had uh, uh, around the place um, that's her hypothesis Other examples. Now we can see on those the bridges <coughs> which have details of the frets, fret marks. And this is important as they can be measured. And you see, be, be, not with this one, but if you follow the, the, the be, below F1, F2, F3, F4, this is fret 1 fret 2, the uh, ratio is 9 over 8, which is the ratio of a tone. Uh, then F2 to F3 is 4, 3, which is the ratio of a fourth. And uh, F3 to F4 is a ratio of semi-tonish interval. So we can uh, from the iconography have uh, measurements which are quite uh, accurate. And of course, if we measured only one of those, we could say, oh, by luck, oh yes, it works. But if you have hundreds of them, and they all have uh, uh, measurements, uh, you know, which, which, are, which correspond to each other, then we can uh, be sure that there, there's some meaning in this. 
And I've done the same thing with the uh, Alaja Huyuk uh, instrument, which is called the Alaja Huyuk guitar that you see here, and my reconstruction on the left of the picture. And the fret marks also had the same dimensions, same uh, uh, ratios at the uh, fret marks from Elam. So we can say that from Elam, from Malaja Huyuk, from Egypt, uh, we had similar intervals. Not always and for every instrument, but there were uh, at least some instruments which shared the same uh, 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 in the same measurements. Now, the next picture will be this instrument which I made, I can't remember what date, I made it at Alasha Huyuk during a season of excavation there and I made this instrument, this replication, and I gave it to the museum uh, of the small town of Alasha Huyuk to, in the archaeological uh, house. Now, we have here the Battle of Ulai. For this. You can stop it. Now, there's something interesting about these lies here. Uh, many uh, researchers in the past have wondered why these harps had a notch in the middle of the soundboards, as you can see. And uh, it's <coughs> in our reconstructions with one other of my students, Margot uh, Bousquet, that we decided to uh, investigate the matter and we simply discovered something which is, which is quite unusual. We note that the longer strings are attached to the shortest, to the smallest volume of sandbox. Why the smallest strings have got the larger sandbox? This is totally uh, on, uh, done in, in organology. So we discovered de facto that these halves are in fact two halves, one on top of the other. As you can see here on the Myro construction there. So this was a discovery also that was made from uh, uh, replication. Ah, <laughs> this is me restringing the harp at Harvard where we gave a demonstration and master class on the thing with the bright students who I gave them the instrument to uh, restring completely oh, here you have the instruments now, remount them, dismount them, uh, and try to make something out of them. And it worked very well. Now we are arriving at theory. Any questions up to now? Yes? Sorry. But this one that you have, that was in here, the right one. The harp there. Yes. How is it two harps then? Based on this gap that there is Well. Between, between the it's in it's not exactly two halves. I'm going to try to uh, explain it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Two halves are two halves. 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 Two halves are two
Uh, this is not the case. This is how I came to the conclusion that it had a meaning would be to do with timber. So therefore, both parts have different timbers due to the different size of the sound boxes. Therefore, that I call two different instruments. This instrument is not in tune because I, I you know, I keep playing with them. But, uh, and different tones. Eh? No doubt, it's very distinct, very distinct. So we came to this conclusion. By the way, this instrument was made also uh, from, uh, like all the instruments which we reconstruct, they are made with the tools of the period, or only, no black and decker, no shiny screws, uh, no, a glue that we made ourselves, uh, um, and everything is handmade. The paint here is uh, iron oxide mixed with uh, egg yolk, as it used to be, and the egg white is beaten, is used as varnish on top of it. We know that they did this, so therefore we use the, the systems. The inside of the lye is painted with bitumen, which is a material which is very useful to, to uh, fill up gaps and so forth. So in this instrument, all is absolutely uh, uh, made, uh, you know, as it would have been made in, uh, in uh, oh, I've got a problem, the soundboard here. Of course, here the nails are not the proper nails. These are the same size of nails than the ones we have from the, from the uh, boxes at the museum. <coughs> but I could find them uh, the same sizes at Ryman's, <laughs> amazingly. So I bought them at Ryman's, you know. And I do not hide the fact that they are from Ryman's. So this is a, an instrument which is typically uh, elamite. We cannot dispute it. It is elamite. The Assyrian later, uh, during the, the, the end of the first, up to the end of the first millennium, millennium made copies of the Assyrian harps but there were more uh, one harp rather than two harps together. So they, they didn't want to bother having two, uh, two distinct parts. Sorry, I have a question. Yes? Uh, you mentioned this that we can uh, tell how old the, you know, the depiction is based on the angle that you know, the lute is held. Uh, I, I just noticed something and I wanted to ask about that as well. I, I saw, I, you know, at least it, it appeared to me that the naked uh, players also used something like a guitar pickup to play the lute. They do, is yes. Is that correct? Yes. And can we say that also an indication of how old that depiction is? Or is it has been like a mixed thing that people either use their, their fingers or the, or the pickup? Yeah, uh, they used to have plectra, plectra attached to the instrument. This we find with Adaja Huyuk, and we find them with the naked uh, bow leg musicians also, and in some other cases uh, a bit later in Assyria. So having, um, yes, an attached uh, plectrum was quite common, definitely. Now, theory will be a bit, I don't know if you, you are conversant with, with music theory, we shall see. Now, now this is the oldest ever Sumerian tablet which includes names of instruments and names of strings of musical instruments. It dates from around 2700 BC and uh, it, it is also in the Skoyan collection. Remarkable text. I have not had much time to work on it because I had other things to do, but it is most interesting. Personally, they say that it includes 23 musical instruments 
I dispute this because I only found six of them and uh, it says that it's got the nine strings of an instrument and I personally only find four strings which could be musical instrument strings. So sometimes we have to be careful with, uh, with uh, uh, over-enthusiastic people claiming things extraordinary. Now, in uh, music theory it all starts with three notes. That is a rule. And we, we find in the ancient Near East, uh, to this day also, that music is always made of chains of thirds, which follow each other in a way or the other. That's a, a, a general rule. So, we have an example which I will give you, which comes from... No, this is an illustration. Sorry, an illustration. Do, do bear with me, I'm a bit tired with all these things. Um, you see, here we have drawings of the balag, in th uh, different signs of the balag, on three tablets. They have three strings. So number three is very important in theory. And they uh, in, indeed also uh, uh, make it clear on the uh, text they have. Now another sign also, Z247, we gave them names. Uh, this is Z247, 3200. This is also a monostructural uh, harp. As you can see very clearly, then we are... Now, please, could we have some music on this one? Um, a bit louder, possibly. Thank you. This, this, is, <coughs> this is an example that you can actually make music with three notes and not more than this. And in this case, the three notes are, are, are tones, tones, interval tone tones. Please? Mm. Here? You see that the three notes, you have a central note, which is the, set, the, the, the nucleus, and the two, two other notes gravitate around this thing. This is how the early melodies are, are made. Now, next one. Thank you. Oh, oh. Now, you have here Do, Re, Mi, Re. Again, Do, Re is a tone, Re, Mi is a tone, Re. You have the nucleus in the middle is the D. The C and the E are satellite notes around the melody. This is how it works. Now, this uh, systolic, I call it systolic because it's tense. Hmm? The systolic third was known as Shal Shatu in Akkadian. How do we know this? Because we know the tablets from which we extracted that this, uh, uh, these three notes were called Shal Shatu. Or I say were called all genes Shal Shatu, to use the Arabic uh, uh, name for a series of three pitches. Hmm? Now, Cherum is another melody uh, which actually it's not a melody, let me explain it to you a bit clearer. Sherum uh, Wasib, Wasib 
is uh, the oldest one of the oldest lullaby we know. It's from the about 2000 BC. I wanted to experiment with making music to it, following what I know about the construction of these early melodies. So Sevan Habib is going to sing you this melody. Essentially what it says, it says, you little boy in the dark house, you have made noise. You have disturbed the god of the house. He's very, very angry. Because he said you were dancing like a drunken man on a stool in a bar, falling all over the place. And if you do not shut up immediately, he will eat you. <laughs> this is nice for lullaby, eh? <laughs> so, if you please. So, it's, it's, it's my composition has got no uh, a pretension of being an authentic piece. This time, the interval used is based on a, a, a diastolic interval, that is a relaxed one, in which the, the, the you have the nucleus in the middle, the E, but the F is a semitone, uh, not quite a semitone, but about a semitone. The semitone is at that time not uh, defined. To have a, a semitone defined, it must come from a construction. For the moment, it's an approximation of a semitone, which is not due to a construction. Now, we find these musics up to Africa, I said in my introduction. And here we have a pygmy musician of the Cameroon playing the Angbingi. And uh, he's got a drone note, the D, but he plays three notes uh, 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 again, if it works. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this Anbingi uh, bow is that it is a branch stemming from the ground, which the musician places above his, uh, around his back. At the apex of the branch, he fixes a string, which he attaches to a bit of wood on the floor on which he sits. And the tension or relaxation of the 
the bow is made by the hand lifting or pressing. This is how it works. Now this is a very important because this will lead later to the caronomic instructions. You have a middle note, you have an upper note, middle note, lower note, and this is probably how this idea of conducting choirs came. Thank you. <laughs> Systemic linear. This is getting very complicated. Um, when we speak about music theory, we are quite happy to see uh, uh, notes in a special order, but there's something to be known is there was there was a linear theory and then there was a cyclical theory. The linear theory is when all the notes are listed one after the other mm? and the cyclical is when these notes are set around a circle. And it is the setting of these notes around the circle which created the heptatonic system, as we shall see later. Now, to understand this, <coughs> we have the lie there with the stringing uh, uh, tassels. This is the cultural, cultural support. Now, we turn the thing on the side I told you writing changed its time, uh, its uh, direction with time. From being vertical, it turned to the right by 90 degrees. So then we can write things this way on a line. Prime strings, neck strings, and so forth. This is actually the, this is actually the terminology of the strings as it is given on a text called Nabitnu 32 which is a text which dates from about 800 BC but which is a copy of a far older older text. How do we know this? We know this because the... Uh, here, here's the text. We know this because in this text which is from about 800 BC I don't know if there are cuneiformists among you in this room but here we have uh, on this first column, Sumerian, and we have Akkadian on this column. So sometimes if we've got a text in which we have Sumerian Akkadian, it means that the Sumerian uh, prevails on the Akkadian, that therefore the initiator would have been Sumerian. If we have a first column in Akkadian, then the Akkadian we had, we had pre, been predominant in this text and the Sumerian would therefore be a translation uh, of the Akkadian into a modern form of Sumerian. But if we have, as on this text, Sa uh, Di in the first to the uh, top right, Sa Di, Sa Ush, Sa Tri Sa Tu, Sa uh, this is absolutely Sumerian and it is not always equivalent to the part in Babylonian. So if the Sumerian varies in its meaning from the Babylonian, it is because there have been distinctions. And these distinctions I have I have analyzed in this way. Now, if you have Mm. No, I think I better uh, uh, continue a bit more on this. Now, you see the, uh, now the names in, Babylon, in Sumerian, transition Sumerian, and the Babylonian here. Then, how this happens, you see the yoke, as I've told you, has moved, it is now vertical. Now, we have to start with the tuning system. It would happen this way. From the fifth string in the middle, 
because it's counted, uh, it's palin palindromically, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now, the interval for the fifth string to the behind string and the interval from the fifth string to the first string would be intervals of the fifth. That is, do, re, mi, uh, um, la, si, do, re, sorry, <coughs> is descending. So, la, sol, fa, mi, re, re, do, si, la, sol. So, sol, re, re, la. <coughs> right. So, we would have a system based on this thing. And then, they would add fourths. And a second series of fourths would lead to sol, la, do, re, mi, sol, la which is an anhemitonic system. I don't want to call it a pentatonic system because pentatonic is five degrees. Sol, la, do, re, mi, sol, la, do, re, mi, sol. But this is a, a, a system which, which is larger. And this system is exactly the system that we find later uh, mentioned by uh, studies of early Gregorian intonation. This is actually what they did. They only had the system and in between sol, la, do, re, mi, they, they had holes there where they placed either a, a B flat or an F sharp. But these were difficult to place because it was not easy at that time to hear properly the value of a semitone. So they prefer to ignore it and they could apply it in certain, uh, certain conditions. But it was a thing difficult to understand the uh, position of the semitone. Now, would you like please to sing, we, we have a few Gregorian pieces. Now you see from the scale, sol, la, do, re, mi, sol, la, do, re, fa, sol, la, do, re, Re, mi, sol, la, si, re, 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 mi. And even shake a Kelly Creator and in Sanctum, etc., etc. We have two examples of early Gregorian chant which uses the Babylonian model. So you see, these melodies try to push in the semitone. It's difficult, but they, they attempt to make it work. <coughs> and finally, one day it worked. I won't go into explaining this, there's no point, but to see how it works, you see we have the different degrees, uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, four, three, two, one, the nine degrees, La, sol, fa, mi, re, do, si, la, sol. We have uh, la, sol, fa, mm, uh, fa, mi. We have this semitonic degree, two, four, six, six, two, five, six, two, four, three, here and here, which uh, we will call strofa in Gregorian chant, and which we will call pien oculisma. Pien is the Chinese word to express this value because the Chinese had also to wrestle with the value of the semitone and the kilisma is also the name used by in Gregorian chant. So we can say with great satisfaction <laughs> that Gregorian chant finds its sources in Babylonian theory. And indeed it is known that the early fathers of the church who uh, were asked by the Pope to teach the singers of uh, uh, European uh, monasteries came from the Middle East. 
Now, Plato, what does he do? Well, he takes the muses and with the ratios of 8, 9, 10, 9, 16 and so forth. So he's got a, a scale of 9 pitches. So Mr. Plato uses also the same system. He varies slightly the values of the numbers by uh, multiplying them to uh, five, uh, five, 4,500, 4,800, 4,320 and so forth. But essentially we have intervals of 8, 9, 10, 9, 16, 15, 8, 9, 8, 9, 8 and so forth. So uh, Mr. Uh, Plato uh, um, had a good look at the Babylonian system and built his, uh, the value of his muses on a Babylonian system. Now we find the same thing with Vicious. So m coming closer to our days, where Vicious then decides to have the B flat included automatically in his scaling. So he's getting more modern in the system. Now, ambitor theory. Now, okay, this is a, a, a cheese grater. Not to grate your cheese, to put on your macaroni. It's a rather old one, a CBS 10996. It gives you, it gives all the intervals of the pitches in, in, a, in a series. But, as you will see, the numbers here are rather irregular, uh, you know, it jumps all over the place. The reason is that this text was a, a transformation of an earlier text to suit heptatonism. And because you had compressed the degrees into seven, then you would have these irregularities that you would not have should you have a system which did not respond to heptatonism. As here, we see a continuity of pitches. And I don't believe that initially this text was devised to have the thirds as well as the fifths. It was do, sol, re, la, mi, si, fa, do, and so forth. And then another other series would be sol, si, la, do, etc. But it means that they had all the elements, all the structural elements, to build a system. Now, <laughs> we have seven ascending ajnas of thirds. Re, mi, fa, do, re, mi, do you want to sing them, a few of them? But from here you can, you can sing, if you feel. And you have seven descending ashnas, a fifth. Thank you, that's fine. Now, their intervals of fifths were made from two intervals of thirds, two conjoined intervals of thirds. You had jeans titurichartum plus jeans ischkum equals jeans nishtorim. This is the way it worked. Then they take two fifths, two descending fifths, they, they conjoined and they uh, they, this produces an N accord, a Makam N accord, Nishtorim. And this is how they make it work. Now, scale Makamian structure is getting a bit more complicated. Let me try to simplify things. Now, we have all the seven Enea chords span on the Pentadecal chord. This is the span of the different scales they had. 
I don't want to make you more confused with this. This is the, the uh, different intervals they had and the order in which they were presented. The thirds, the fifth, the N accords. So we cannot find anything much more uh, uh, clearly defined. And remember that this is two th two, uh, 4,000 years ago. Mm. Now, the dodecaphonic metabolization of the old Babylonian electronic mechanism system. This is, a, this is a tablet, which is called U780, which is the, uh, the field number. We gave it back to the Museum of Baghdad in 1973, and this is only a, a plaster cast. It's all we have in the British Museum. I was again at the British at the Baghdad Museum on numerous occasions in the past days, and they still cannot find it. Now, it is interesting to see that the system of organizing different uh, uh, scales rested on the knowledge of chromaticism. This is extremely important because our chromaticism dates much later in, in our history. You see, for instance, if you, if you would like to sing the first line up to the D, and the second, sorry, the second line up to D, and this one up to D. You see, this is how it worked. Essentially, they organized their scales as follows. They have a scale of nine pitches. In the, the set of nine pitches, they look for the interval which is la zaku in Sumerian, in Akkadian, which means unpleasant, not clear. It's the, not a tritone, but it will become a tritone. It's the, um, it's for, it's 588. It's a diminished fifth. And they will correct this tritone by increasing it by a semitone, thus generating another scale. And on this other scale, they will locate the other dissonance. They will correct the note, one or the other note, and thus generating another scale and so forth. This is how they managed to create their system of eight scales in a system uh, which is called the thetical system. That is when you have sharps more and more sharps instead of having diatonic where you have the scale of do, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, re, mi, and so forth. So this system, we, we have to remember, was, was invented 4,000 years ago at least. And it's a system which was never equated after by any other culture. Now this is the scale which uh, come from all this. You have them in in different aspects in Andic Accord, 11 degrees, in, in 9 degrees and 7 degrees, because they had different ambitus for different purposes. Now, this we may construe that during the old Babylonian period, music theory, theoreticians had invented metabolic dodecaphonism in handicatonic, eniatonic, and heptatonic systems, which were only reinvented in Western system in the 17th century. Now, the equal temperament, uh, equal temperament heptatonic emergence from the psychical revolution. Now, this is what they did then, it was absolutely brilliant. <coughs> this tablet is about 800 BC. Uh, and uh, it, it, at the beginning it was considered as being an astrological text because it was difficult to read the things around the, the star. But finally we know it was, we could read that there are names of strings and these are numbers which are descending fifths, ascending fourths. When you have it's a tuning system, we know it. 
So therefore, this is the Chiling system in question. You see, here it goes. This is the column, this is the indications from the heptatin uh, uh, star. But something which escaped many researchers is that the heptagram is, on, is not equal, is irregular, and there is a reason for that, is that the scribe attempted at locating semitones from tones, at segregating semitones from tones. And finally, this is what he did. He took a rope, which is the linear system, placed it around the star, and discovered that you had two A's and two G's. And that was it. They invented heptatonism. That is how it was invented. And this is the first millennium. We don't have this, I'm sorry to say in Greece or elsewhere, this is really a Babylonian uh, 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 wonder. Now, going further, since they were, they, since they used sexagesimalism, that is base 60 mathematics, they would have used the uh, 360 degrees for building their star, the heptagram. And of course, they realized soon that 30 degrees was for uh, semitone and 60 degrees for a tone. Of course, did they use this? I'm not sure. But they had the possibility of using it. And that is interesting. But I wouldn't state for a second that this is what they did. That is an observation which is worth mentioning. Uh, ah, but all this would be very nice, but now we need to have some evidence. Now, God numbers, the God had numbers. Anu 60, 50, 40, uh, 30. That's it. We have the structure of a scale. And now we compare this to the natural harmonics, and it fits perfectly well. So the, the God numbers corresponded to the natural harmonics of a sound. I think they were quite clever. This is what happened. They're semitones and the equivalent in Western uh, 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 equal temperament. So we saw already. Now this tablet which I've condensed on one, is the uh, condensation, condensation for, from four tablets coming from Nippur, uh, dating about 2300. We have here, uh, they all have 12,960,000, which equals to 60 to the power of 4, and 3,600 to the power of 2 as their dividend. Now, the numbers here from 36 to 81, this is the any accord, and this is the quantification. This is done, this dates from uh, uh, 4,300 years. Something spectacular. So this, uh, uh, how would I put it, confirms the validity of other systems. Now, this is how the whole thing works. Now, the proof is in the pudding. It's in the eating of the pudding. Now, when a tablet like this, which is Hurrian, a language which, when it was uh, discovered in northwest Syria, was unknown, I managed to translate it finally, or at least translate the music and part of the, uh, the lyrics. And um, this is what it gave musically, Cabalité 3, Irbouté 1, and so forth. So it means we had an interval, and the last note of the interval had to be lengthened by three units. 
and so forth. When we do this, we have equal lengths of lines of 36 beats, or 72 and 36. And this is what comes of it. Now, we're going to have this interpretation by our favorite natural intelligence. Yes, yes. Thank you. Now, this <coughs> interpretation is not tonal, it is modal. It means that certain adaptation, uh, certain increases, certain notes. Uh, how did I come to this? It was in 2011 in Damascus, which was uh, starting to get uh, a bit shaky <laughs> as a city. And I, we had a, a conference with musicians, and I was a bit uneasy about playing them this melody, thinking, oh, they're going to say, oh, this is absolute rubbish, nothing to do with us, mate. You should try to do better. Contrarily, I was absolutely amazed to see these guys, who are Macam masters, started to hum this melody, and telling me, oh, this should be Bayati. Uh, so, so I take notes, and this should be like this, like this. So what we have listened from uh, uh, Sevan is actually the advice from these masters. But I'm quite certain that there was not one way of singing this melody. They would sing it in different modes, keeping the tonal system, but having different intonations depending on the way they felt things. And that's the beauty of the Maccamian system that was developed in the Middle East. Now, I'm afraid that I cannot offer you much more about all this. <laughs> and I think I, I, you know, I could have gone on for much, much, much longer with all these texts and things, because there are other texts to explain, but I think it was sufficient uh, to uh, have your brains rattled a bit too much for a Saturday uh, afternoon. But if you want more, I'm absolutely corvigable in the, with answering any of your most erudite questions. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. So, can you explain how these uh, semi semitones, uh, you know, were, were introduced? But how about the one fourth, the quarters that right now we have in the, you know, modern uh, Middle Eastern yeah. music? So, when they were introduced? It's a progression. <coughs> it took a long time to reach 
in antiquity the value of the tone uh, to be to be constant then it took us a, a long time to incorporate a kind of semitone then which was consecrated as a semitone by application of systems and then you know it took times to develop this so therefore the quart tone in uh, in uh, in Macamian music firstly I will say doesn't exist there's no such thing as a quarter tone in oriental music there are <coughs> elements which are smaller than or bigger than the quarter tone and they are added on other elements which are smaller than or bigger than uh, uh, other intervals and this is what makes the absolutely wonderful uh, uh, color of Arabian music or Middle Eastern music and you cannot achieve it uh, with any other system now in in West in Western music we progress we start with a with a, a tonal with a tone fixed tone then we go there and we go there and we always relate every pitch we play to the initial one always and indeed we base our Schenkerian an analysis on, on this principle but with uh, Middle Eastern music with the Macamian system you have one starting note a second note and the third note is only in relation to the second the fourth note is in relation to the third but never to the first this is why the quarter tone doesn't exist as a fixed value I've heard quarter tones in, in the Middle East uh, th this marvelous University of Catholic in Lebanon where I I was invited for uh, conferences and things they have a choir of absolutely lovely uh, a choir of 40 incredibly uh, uh, um, wonderful singers um, singing uh, unisono singing equal temperament makam this is so painful <laughs> that I remember being sitting in the front row with other colleagues of mine who were Macamian you know and we couldn't escape because we were on the front row and no way out and it went on and on and on and on and our ears were pouring with blood <laughs> so this question of the quarter tone is, is, is to be seen in another context not as a fixed value it exists the way it has to it can modify something and it's absolutely wonderful it's ma magnificent and we and the same goes with other subtleties in the microtonal world because nothing is a nothing is always the same you can take a good Macam player record him the morning and the evening do the same recording it's not the same thing the music has varied because depending on the mood on the day on this on that it changes even on, on the weather depending on so many things and of course we also describe music of the Middle East as a trip hop you leave your home in the morning you are quite happy you go around you see some friends you have a discussion then you go to the forest and it's nice and you have a nap and then you do this and you do that so it's a travel you're traveling through uh, uh, different places and that's what is my come Yes. Thank you for your uh, presentation. And a general question. Um, so, from what you say in antiquity, the, uh, the first instrument was over 5,000 years old. Um, and presumably, it would have been a string. Do we have any um, evidence of uh, the very first string, how it was made, and how they would have thought about the fact that? 
sound. Yeah, well, <laughs> the invention of gut string was not made intentionally for music making. Uh, strings made from guts were used for sewing, for, for uh, you know, as many things you can think. Uh, it, it was simply, uh, uh, somebody said, oh, it could be nice to put on my bow, and yes, it sounds good. That's how it happened. We know, on the other hand, uh, uh, the different techniques that they used. We have good accounts of them, uh, of, of how this worked from the Marie archives. And we know, for instance, that the best strings in the Middle East during the, the rule of uh, Yashma Adu in the 18th mm, BC came from Aleppo. Why Aleppo? But we see uh, uh, orders you know, from different places, from Mari, from there, from there, from there. Please send us some of your strings, we are missing them, we haven't got enough strings for our music school. Uh, uh, so we do not know what was the uh, thing about m m the Aleppo strings. Not a clue. But this is interesting. I, I'm pretty sure that it had something divine. Probably there was the goddess of the strings who lived in Aleppo uh, making things uh, this way. But strings were not used exclusively, uh, gut strings. They would use also uh, uh, strands of uh, hide, which they twisted. They would also use tendon, uh, because in uh, uh, sa, the sign sa equals pitnu, sa sumerian pitnu equals string, but also uh, I'm trying to find the name, the other name. Giranu, it's the tendon. But tendons are not very good because when you have a tendon, you can split the tendon in different strands, but it's never long enough to make a proper string. They, were, they, were, they, they certainly use vegetal strings, that's certain. Yes. Hello. In general rule, this fellow there was for the temple, was in the temple. There was one and there was a priest going with it at the uh, temple and that is it. Later we had smaller versions of these uh, big things which came to the court. But principally, essentially, it was for the divine office. And nobody was allowed around. It was something very mysterious. They would hear dong, 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 dong. Some sounds which were very, very uh, uh, worrying. And uh, also they had drums with those. Pom, 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 dong, dong. Okay, now, the lutes in the Middle East were never ne never reached uh, the level of of you know of, of serious instrument never we never find them at the court we find them in in lascivious scenes of copulation between two characters in the street and seem uh, and people seem to enjoy this kind of scene and um, that's about it. But you do not find 
uh, usage of lutes in uh, in the at the court or at the temple. It's only in Elam that you find uh, a possible usage of these lutes for uh, court practice or cult practice. Now the other instruments, the harps were festive. They were the kind of, uh, you know, the, the nice instrument to play, to play. It was the piano of the time. Who didn't have a, you know, that, that was about it. Um, they were never, these were never used for, uh, specifically for ritual uh, reasons. It was just, just to, to play uh, pop music, you know. The flutes, same thing. They were not really uh, considered seriously. They were amusing things. That's it. Cannot say much more. We, we have texts, but they generally are, are, are not very helpful. We know that this was the case in Greece, but we have no evidence of it in the Middle East. I'm sure it has happened, but we have no text stating it, so therefore I cannot tell you that it happened without the evidence. We know, you know in Greece we know that the soldiers were trained to, to learn insults uh, before going to battle and they would start banging on their <laughs> and so, you horrible thing and actually it's a pity you didn't see the uh, uh, scene of the Battle of Wulai because I'm the speaker there and I'm launching Akkadian uh, insults, uh, Assyrian insults uh, against the enemy uh, and um, uh, of course you would not have uh, grasped what I was saying exactly but it was not very nice insults. <laughs> So it's possibly the only uh, occurrence of insults in a scene of battle. <laughs> All right, there is room for one last question. Is there any more questions? All right. Well, I would say that if anybody uh, wants to have more, uh, this was a very, very, very superficial introduction to the field of ancient, the music of the ancient Near East. But should anyone uh, want to, 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 to know more about it, well, simply send me an email, you know. Uh, I will always be delighted to answer to you. Well, thank you for your cabinet. <laughs> Thanks. I feel better. <laughs>
I want to take a moment to reflect on the enchanting melodies that have filled this space. The performance has transported us through time, offering a glimpse into the ancient sounds that once graced the lands of Elam and Middle East. Before we bid our farewells, I wish to express our gratitude to Richard Dumbrell, Sawan Habib, Babak Mirzai, and Said Ghiasi for their collaborative efforts as well as Cambridge University Persian Society and a dedicated Persian Wonders team. Your collaborative contributions have made this event a resounding success and we extend a heartful thanks. As we part ways, let me leave you with this exciting news for the future. We have another captivating event in the store, a discussion on the history of board games with presentation by Dr. Irving on 11th of November. If you have any questions or curious about our events, please don't hesitate to reach any of us. Your presence here has been a privilege and we eagerly anticipate sharing more enriching experiences with you in the future. Thank you all for joining in this exploration of ancient musical wonders. Thank you.